So this works. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, today's talk is uh, going to be about uh, identity authorization authentication, uh, uh, primarily uh, using uh, Angular and ASP.NET. Uh, now I have this generic talk that I'm trying to recycle. Uh, since this uh, is primarily a .NET audience, I'll try to highlight the aspects of ASP.NET uh, identity and authentication of ASP.NET. Uh, but we'll be using uh, things like Angular for the front end, ASP.NET Core on the back end, uh, Auth0 as our identity server, and then a bunch of other uh, tools like uh, Fiddler, JWT, debug, and all that stuff. Uh, so uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, and also I print blog, so that's my blog. Okay, uh, so let's start with, uh, you know, spend a couple of minutes on the basics. So, uh, who here is familiar with uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth? Just here. Okay. Uh, what do you think OpenID is? Okay, so uh, that, that was the exact same confusion that I encountered when uh, I started off in this space. Uh, and the documentation is very confusing, right? Uh, oh, thanks. Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the there are specs for both. Uh, OAuth is a formal protocol, uh, as is OpenID Connect. Uh, but the general documentation over the web is a little bit confusing. So, try to clarify it here. So. Uh, Open ID uh, or, or Open ID Connect or uh, as it's called OIDC, uh, it's an authentication protocol, not an authorization protocol, right? It only authenticates. So it allows you to prove who you are. It doesn't deal with your permissions. It, it, when you say I am user X, it asks you to uh, provide your credentials and prove who you are. So this allows you to uh, you know, uh, carry your identity across a uh, bunch of platforms and this is what we primarily call single sign-on. OAuth, uh, or rather OAuth 2.0, o, which is like the second revision of OAuth, uh, deals with authorization rather than authentication. Uh, authorize, authentication is proving who you are. Authorization is about what permissions do I have. So, uh, OpenID is built on top of uh, OAuth 2.0. Uh, so OAuth 2.0 already uh, was in existence, uh, great uh, authorization protocol, and then they decided to put the authentication layer on top of it. So uh, if you heard of uh, words like ID token or JWTs, uh, OpenID Connect is uh, the OpenID Connect uh, spec is rather responsible for it. While access token, so ID token deals with your identity. Access token with your access permissions, and that is handled with the OAuth spec. Uh, it also uh, OIDC also deals with something called as standardized codes, and this we will look into when we decompose a JWT. We look into what uh, goes inside a JWT uh, or tokens rather. Uh, and OAuth is responsible for something called as claims and custom claims, standard claims and custom claims inside a uh, token. We'll have a separate slide for this at uh, a later point. We'll look at that. All right. Uh, quick questions so far? I hope this is correct, right? Uh, this is uh, uh, clear. Uh, all of them are built on top of HTTP and HTTPS protocol, so nothing out of the ordinary here. <coughs> so uh, uh, we must have all heard of uh, these OAuth flows, like how do I gather the user's consent, how do I gather what permissions the user needs. Uh, now it again depends on whether the user is on a mobile device, on a uh, single page application executing JavaScript on the front end, or is it a, uh, something like ASP.NET, which is a server side web server. Uh, is it a daemon or a service? So depending on where the user is, uh, we generally recommend what are different flows and these are pretty standardized, there's nothing out of the order here. So the first and simplest flow we look at is what we call as implicit flow or also uh, you may know it as implicit grant. That's the two standard terminologies used. 
So, in the film, it's sort of like a choreographed dance between four actors. So, you have your user, which is you, who's logging on uh, uh, a certain service. You have the client app, you have the app that you're logging into. You have an authorization server. So, essentially, something that manages your identity, authentication, and authorization. And you have the backend resource that is being guarded by this authorization server. So, a simple example is I need to log in into, uh, let's say, Netflix using my Facebook ID. So, Netflix becomes my resource API uh, and the authorization server is provided by Facebook. So, in this example, we'll be using something called as Auth0, which is a pretty famous, uh, rather it's becoming famous uh, really fast. Uh, Two other typical examples of uh, authorization servers are Azure uh, Active Directory, Okta, Identity Server if you have used uh, ASP log. So those are the four actors involved. Uh, so there's also other actors involved like user agent uh, browser, but I'm sort of obfuscating that details just because I want to keep things simple. So what happens is, is this legible? I mean, you can see this, right? Yeah. The text. Okay. So uh, the user clicks on some login button. Uh, so and then the app sends an authorization request to the authorization server. So specifically, it calls the authorization servers. So authorization server exposes some well-known endpoints. One of them is called slash authorize. And it provides a bunch of details, right? Uh, so the client app is already registered with the uh, authorization server. So it has a client ID, uh, it supplies that. Uh, there's a redirect URI, so if everything is successful, it will call back into the app. So the redirect URI has to be supplied. Uh, state is some uh, data that you pass in that you get back as well. Uh, let's ignore that for now. And uh, there's a response type uh, which we specify token and ID token. So this this is the most critical thing right here. Uh, token is for getting the ID, uh, access token and ID token is for getting the identity token. So when you specify these two, the authorization server knows that it's inside an implicit flow. Uh, and then you specify a scope called OpenID which is for authentication. Then the authorization server has the redirect URI. And it sends a 302 redirect back to the user. So that at that point the user gets a login prompt. User logs in and then they get a consent prompt saying, do you want to give these permissions to this app? Facebook uh, asks you whether uh, do you want to provide your friends list to Netflix. So uh, you successfully uh, consent and then uh, goes back to the authorization server and uh, you get something called as an authorization grant. So, authorization grant returns back, it calls into a redirect URI and provides you the ID and access token. Okay. Now you receive, uh, now that you have the ID and access token, now you are free to uh, talk, talk to the uh, resource API. So, uh, ID token identifies you, access token tells what permissions you have. So, uh, you request a resource using the access token and you get a response back and that's how you access the API, right? So, the authorization server sort of acts like a shield between the uh, user and client app and the backend API. So, uh, there is this concept of front channel and back channel. Uh, front channel generally means like a less secure, uh, uh, less secure uh, channel like where you use public internet or untrusted machines. So uh, this flow is entirely on front channel. There is no back channels here. You are not, so all this code is executing inside a single page application running in uh, you know, which is running uh, you know, in JavaScript uh, on uh, on a on Chrome browser, for example, Angular app. So there is no back channel here. So everything is executing in the front end. So uh, which is why we don't see things like client secrets, which is not uh, safe to store client secrets. Because client secret is like a master key. If anybody gets it, if you have a malicious uh, browser extension that gets it, or if somebody has a uh, man in the middle attack, sniffs out uh, using a proxy, then essentially you lost the plot. So, uh, 
So, uh, so, this, so what happens is you uh, provide the scope and the uh, uh, flow type, and you directly get the uh, ID uh, token and the access token without exchanging the uh, exchanging the client secret. So there is no bad chunk here. Questions so far? So the user who logs in into the client app. Sorry? If there are multiple if there are multiple users logging into the app, uh, so all of them will have the same client ID, is it? The client ID is for the app, not for the user. So the user specific uh, yeah. So user gets a uh, authentication prompt like dialog and actually I'll walk through a demo and they have to fill in their own credentials, the username and password and they have to be their own consent and whatever they have specified, their identity, their access levels comes back in the form of the ID token and access token that is on their session. So any client app which comes up and wants to wants to communicate in this manner yeah. has to register with the authorization server Correct. and Correct. The authorization server will Correct. log it in the client. Correct. Just another Uh, command line interface, uh, command line apps, separate flow. 
and have a side bread box which flows in it. Okay, so let's do a demo. Uh,
So now it's going to ask you for your consent. Hey, do you want to provide your uh, profile details and email? So the part where I, the screen where I entered the credentials, username and password, that is the authorization, auth authentication. This is the authorization. So I say yes. Okay. All right. So uh, now I get a email from Auth0 saying, "Hey, do you, can you please verify this uh, email?" So I just put on my mobile app, I'm verifying my account, and that is done. Okay. Is configuring Auth0. Sir. Uh, email. So it's a regular Gmail account. Uh, now uh, all zero knows about it. All zero knows that uh, my Gmail uh, user is a valid, uh, valid identity for this app. So you have configured that for every new registration? Yeah, for every, so every new registration uh, comes in here. So now if you go to the users and rules, so you see now my uh, email address is now registered, so it's a valid user ID. So the password what you enter there, the Gmail password and the new password what you enter It's a password for Auth0. So if you change the Gmail password, you have to change the password. If you change the Gmail password, it has no effect here. Okay, this is totally different. Totally different. So I can use Sorry? Wrong email ID. So we need to have. It will send you a verification email. So unless you verify it. But, but it is logging in there, then it is sending you a verification email. What if you don't verify it? Sorry? What if you don't verify it? So uh, if you don't verify, then like, it will refuse to send you all, like, all the permission sets in your access to. There, there are like, depending on how the authorization server is implemented, there might be some restrictions. It's a good question and I'll uh, follow up with the offer. It's actually a very good question. So in the interest of time, I'll forward the uh, let's uh, talk offline about that. I'll be happy to share the details. Okay, so uh, right. So let's observe the center of Fiddler for now. So I'm going to start Fiddler. So Fiddler is a network uh, monitor of sorts. So I'm going to so here you can see that my ID and access tokens are here. So it's now pushed into local storage. So let me clear the storage. Okay, and let's go back to the auth flow. And uh, let's say. Okay. Go login. I won't get the consent, uh, just the credentials. I'm oh, sorry, uh, I use my Gmail. Okay. All right. So let's look at the flows that happened here. So this is the part where we go, where is the authorize? Oh, here we go. So this is the part where we uh, call the authorize endpoint with the, uh, so initially when you click on the login button, uh, this is where it gets sent to. And here are the bunch of details that get sent to the authorization endpoint. You see if I can zoom out, zoom this one out. I hope 
folks can see it. If not, I'll just read it on it. I don't think I can zoom this one. Uh, so essentially, you have specified the, uh, the app, provides the client ID, uh, it provides the response type. So it says, I want the implicit flow, uh, token and ID token. Here's the redirect URI or the contact. Here's the scope that I request. So open ID, email. I want the email details, I want the profile details. And uh, there's something called an audience, which backend are you targeting? So the tokens will only be valid for that backend. And uh, state and uh, cryptographic hashes. So, it that. so uh, done. Uh, so now we get a response back. And here, this is a response that gets back. Let's copy value. And let's observe that. So if you break this down, oh sorry, uh, looking at the wrong. So I'm looking at the uh, once a compact gets invoked. There is an access token and there will be an ID token also somewhere. Okay. And those two things, and there is a refresh token as well. So those two things get sent to the callback. And once the callback receives it, all it does is like pushes it into uh, local storage. So here's where it comes into local storage. Uh, So now if we uh, take this value and stick it into a, some JWT decompiler, let's take a look at what's inside it. So here's a website called jwt.io, it's again uh, done by the auth zero guys. So if you want to look inside what's inside a token, both ID and access token use this. So I'm just pasting the, so tokens have three sections, there's a header, uh, the signing algorithm that's used. Uh, the signing key that's used, or rather the identification of the signing key, and here are my ID details, right? So uh, here's my email address that was requested, um, some profile details. Here's my Gravatar picture, uh, you know this Gravatar picture, and uh, what time does the token expire? All that, and here's the signing uh, signature information. So this is the uh, ID token, so there's not much here, it doesn't talk about permissions. Uh, for that we need the access token. So let's take a look at the access tokens. So here's the access token. Uh, so it says, uh, here's the, right now I don't have any permissions. I have not set any permissions. Um, and here, here is the issuer. Here is uh, the audience for the backend API for which this uh, token is valid. So there is nothing right now in this and we will fill it up soon. So this is the JWT section. Uh, Alright, so at this point uh, the front end has logged in uh, one of the tokens and now it is time to make a backend call. So let's do this, right? Uh, I don't have the code sample for the call, so I'll mock it from Fiddler. So what I'm going to do is, uh, so here's my backend API. Uh, I'm going to call. Uh, you remember the resource API that I had shown in the diagram? So that's my ASP.NET server or ASP.NET web API rather. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, the first thing I need to do is go to startup and enable authentication. So this uh, is the middleware that enables all token based, uh, session based, cookie based authentication. And then I essentially use this uh, NuGet package called uh, JWT Bearer, uh, ships uh, from Microsoft. And uh, so this snippet of code is enough to get your standard checks. So here I am exposing some endpoints uh, in my controller. So I have a public controller uh, that anybody can call, don't need to be authenticated. There is a protected controller that only logging users can call. And then there is a uh, special uh, controller action where I need certain claims in my token, certain permissions in my token. Uh, only then the call will be successful. So let's uh, try this, right? So here's the public call. So here's the public call. So no authorization is required to view this message. Now if I go to the protected call, I'll get a 401 error, okay, unauthorized. So what we do is, now we have the token, right? Here's my access token. I copy the access token and in my Fiddler Composer, I'm going to say uh, author, authorization bearer, the bearer token, okay. and uh, the URL is. So this call should now succeed. So the, the tokens that are stored in local storage, they have an expiry 
Uh, once they expire, uh, the, uh, and you pass that to the backend, the backend will reject it, saying that this token has expired. So at that point, you have a refresh token, you pass the refresh token back to the refresh endpoint of the authorization server and get a fresh access token and then pass that to the backend. This is coming over a HTTPS channel. Like you, you, you like only users, you know, have, like users with access to the machine will have the uh, like you need to be in the actual tools to be uh, require access. Or you need to be uh, running something some uh, network proxy like Fiddler, which means you need to be the administrator on the machine. So yes, once you are an administrator on the machine, yeah, 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 yes, you do get the access to it. It's like saying the owner of the house doesn't have the you know, the owner of the house will obviously have the master keys. No, I'm thinking Fiddler is different session, browser is different session. Login to browser. Now we are. You can reuse the the access token anywhere. You can fetch. You can. So initially, I wanted to do this demo through the browser, but I didn't get the time to finish it yesterday night. So I'm just using Fiddler with the access token that I fetch from the browser. But to answer your question, yeah, you, if you have the access token, you can use it anywhere. I can use it on a different machine and then, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, but the key thing there is getting access to that access token, right? Oh. It's like saying, I have the key to the house. I got it from somewhere. Now, we are, of course, once I have the key, it's game over. Yeah, so uh, Fiddler, for example, I have to install a local uh, dev certificate to actually decrypt the HTTPS channel, right? So it's not like anybody can view it, like I actually have to... I'm actually decrypting the HTTPS, right? To actually get, get all those details. It's not directly visible otherwise. And when you do the refresh, it generates a new access token. Yeah. Uh, re uh, refresh... So you are talking about refresh tokens, so every access token comes with an expiry. Like if you call the identity server twice, it will give you two different access tokens. Sorry? If you call the identity server twice, the two responses will be different. Why are you calling the access server twice? Uh, so, if it is expired. Huh, so once this thing expires, you pass something called as a refresh token to the refresh endpoint, the local ID endpoint, and then get a fresh access token. Both the decrypted values will be the same. The same. No. The right side will be the same. No. It'll, it, uh, no yeah, it, it will like, uh, likely be the same, but except that issued at and expiry will be different. So let, let's uh, hold off question. I'll answer your questions, but uh, so we have like 7 or 8 minutes, so I'll uh, get to your questions uh, at the end if you don't mind. Okay, uh, backend API, right? So now uh, here's my ASP.NET API uh, that I've also registered with Auth0 uh, here. So now I'm going to give it a permission. Uh, so I'm going to define a permission called read values. Oh, it's already there. Okay. So I'm going to make sure that the user has access to these permissions. So right now, if I call the if I call the protected by permissions, so protected by permission or permission, protected by permission, okay. and I execute it, I'm going to get a 403 access denied. Okay. So I'm going to give that permission to this user. the read values permission. I've added it. Okay. And uh, that should be all. Now let's log the user out. Otherwise it's clear the storage. And let's re-log it. Get a new Uh, permissions read value. So now my uh, 
local disk is there, our backend can go processing search for this specific link and uh, you know uh, make the request successful. So now if I execute this, oh sorry, I have to change the reference. the read function value is present. So now you get a 200 pack. Okay. And you can do similar things with like roles, role based, you know, permissions are one things, roles are separate. You can put the user in admin role, check for that claim uh, in your backend. That would be. So that role can I uh, take it from the DB also, right? And then can assign, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the op op op0-js. I used MSI, MSI before. MSA. Uh, sorry, MSA. Uh, MSA is for anything to do with Microsoft Graph or Active Directory, uh, Azure Active Directory. Op0 is a separate company itself. Can you go to that Sorry? Can you go to that method like uh, Yeah, sure. So this one, right? The This one, it has to be backed by uh, uh, scope handler. So this is a permission handler which checks for that permission. So this one, it actually checks whether that specific permission requirement or uh, this thing uh, is the read values uh, permission, whether it's actually present or not. And if it's not present, it's going to throw back a 403. Right, so that's a work uh, for custom claims. You have to do a little bit of work and write a handler. Okay, uh, back to presentation. Okay, so uh, so we have this question about okay. So uh, which flows do I use? Uh, you know, depending on what's the app type. So what we demonstrated so far was a single page application, whether you have a React or Angular or App, this is the flow to use. It's called Eclipse it Flow. Uh, primarily dealing with uh, the front channel only, so less secure. Uh, there is user interaction required, there is no requirement for storing the client secret anywhere. And you specify token uh, space ID token to start the implicit flow grant. If you have a traditional server side uh, app like a Ruby on Rails or traditional ASP.NET MVC or something like that, then you are using both the front channel as well as the back channel. Right? So front channel if you use Ajax calls, back channels for server to server communication. So there you use something called as authorization code flow, which is similar to implicit, but you use uh, something called as an authorization flow to fetch the tokens. And I will walk through that in the next slide. Uh, for mobile apps, uh, device identity is, all, uh, is also critical. It's not just important to ensure that user is uh, who they claim they are. The device also has to be the device that claims it claims to be. That FID you are saying? Hmm? FID? No. no. So there is something called as proof key exchange. Uh, so essentially, uh, this is for uh, I, I don't have too much experience with this, but I'm guessing this is for like multi-factor flows, OTPs, and things like that. So you verify the device also in addition to uh, the user. And then you have your uh, CLIs, uh, your background services, and all. Uh, when you use uh, specify the client ID and client secret directly, because this is on a lockdown machine in your server room somewhere. Nobody else has access to it. There is no public channel here. Everything is on a back channel. So all the client secret is required, you will just send it across. Uh, so this is called the client credential branch. And for legacy apps where it's like too much work to refactor all this, uh, you directly specify the username and password. It's the least secure, uh, but it's available as an option. So that's called the resource owner uh, password flow. So these are the, uh, and you can have custom flows as well. So you can read into the uh, OR and YDC specs and create custom flows if you want to. So uh, authorization code flow. So we looked at implicit uh, flow. Now let's look at authorization code flow. This is primarily for uh, server backends. Uh, sorry, uh, server side apps. Uh, the apps like Ruby on Rails or Python Django and uh, ASP.NET MVC. Uh, when the code is executing server side and returns the views. Right. So everything happens on the backend for most parts. So again, the four actors, uh, users, uh, there's a user, there's a client app, the authorization server and authorization API. 
is a text logging button. Uh, an authorization request is sent to the authorization point. Uh, there's a three or two redirect back to the uh, uh, user gets the consent and uh, credentials dialog. User sends the consent. But this time, uh, the user uh, doesn't get the token. The user gets a authorization code. Right? So, so far this has all been executing on the front channel. Right? In a browser, uh, over say public internet or something. So, all you get is the code. You pass that code along to your backend. And then you call the token endpoint to actually fetch the uh, access and ID token. So, this is a more secure uh, step. Uh, so here you are actually passing the client secret. The client secret should not be passed over the front channel only back channels. So here you get the response back, you get the ID and access token uh, in your authorization callback. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, in your authorization callback. And now you use that access token and fetch whatever resources you need. So the only uh, difference is like the addition of the authorization code. Uh, you don't get the tokens directly. Uh, you get the authorization code passing to the back channel. The back channel uses this to fetch the ID and access tokens. So, uh, OIDC endpoints. So, here's my authorization server. So, authorization server uh, exposes a bunch of endpoints. So, one is uh, slash authorize, which is uh, where you supply the client ID uh, and fetch either the you start the flow, uh, implicit flow, uh, code grant, whichever. Um, then there is an endpoint called token, where if you get an authorization code or you have a refresh token, then you extend that in addition, in extend, you know, extend that for an actual ID or access. So there is a user info which essentially you have all the details in your ID and access token scopes and claims but if you want something squashed together at one endpoint the user info provides that for you. There is a revocation endpoint, there is a logout endpoint. Uh, so for all the public keys that are used to sign there is a well known endpoint called well known slash keys where you can get the uh, JWKS which is uh, uh, so JWK is uh, JSON web key, uh, JSON web key set. And if you want to uh, view the uh, server's open ID and uh, OAuth configuration, you can use those last two endpoints. So here's an example, right? So let's take this. So. So these are the you know some of the endpoints exposed. So if I need to view the uh, public keys that are, uh, that my token is signed with, I going to where is that? So these are the public keys that I use to sign my token. It's signed with the private key but verified with the public key, and the backend server retrieves the public keys through this endpoint. So somebody was asking this question, right? Uh, does the resource API talk to the authorization server? Yeah, it actually fetches the uh, public signing keys from this endpoint. But it's very first Sorry? Yeah, only, only for the first time. Yeah. Um, or every time when it feels that the token has expired, it needs to refetch. It again depends on how it is actually implemented. Okay. Uh, JWT structure. Uh, So JWC structure has uh, three parts. Uh, let me just show it in the. So here's the header. So it says that this token is of type JWC, JSON Web Token. Here's the algorithm that's used to sign it. So there are two algorithms. Uh, one is called RS256, which is uh, what we know as uh, asymmetric key signing. Signed with the private key, verified with the public key. Uh, there's also something called as HS256, HMAC SHA256. Uh, so that's symmetric key, less secure. So you are signing it with the client secret. So if the 
why is it exposed? Anybody can you know, say, yeah, this token is very free. Uh, KID is a key signing ID. So it can be signed with multiple keys, uh, like if you have key rotation on. So it says which specific key was uh, used to sign it. Then there is a payment section which has a bunch of claims. So each of these things are known as claims. Uh, even permissions, the scopes that are assigned to it are all claims. And finally you have the signature part where you take the header, uh, you are in base64 encoded, take the payload, base64 encoded, and then supply the public and private key and that generates your signature. And uh, on the back end when you receive it, you just use the public key to verify that this was indeed signed by the private key. So uh, I think that's about all I had. How long do you think like Okay, I'll take questions. What is the difference between JWT and JWE? JWE? I don't know what JWE is. So, uh, different type of, similar to JWT, this is more secure than JWT. I also know that's in the I have no idea, sorry. But in some of the frameworks it's mentioned that instead of JWT, you implement JWE program. I have not used it, I haven't even come across it, so sorry. Is there any concept of like uh, keep alive or silent renewing the... Uh, sorry, is there any concept of... Silent renewing from... Silent renewing the token, ID token... Yes. Yes, some flows support that. Uh, How do we do that? Like, is it dependent on the like, author server? Uh, yes, you are... So, let's see. I think Auth0 supports it. Okay, it's a just provide language support. Like, uh, yeah. It's just saying your own. The work has to be done. But is it supported across uh, like Azure AD or everybody supposed to? So uh, that refresh token that gets handed out to you, your library generally uh, detects that it has uh, you know uh, the access token has expanded and reissues the call back to the token endpoint with the refresh token. So that's your Uh, yes, I, yeah, you can. You can. Every time you essentially call the authorized endpoint, it, again it depends on how your uh, uh, authorization server is implemented, whether it caches it on the backend. Uh, now I know that Auth0 has some sort of like backend session based caching. So if you keep making repeated requests, it's just going to, for the same user, it's going to send you back a cache token. Uh, but then you can, again have policies where you can like override that behavior. No, they are required. The flow is more or less the same. The implementation might be a little bit different, right? You may get like a different dialogue. Your uh, scopes inside the JWT might look a little different, but overall it's the same thing. Uh, you need the uh, credentials, you need the consent. Uh, you are going to get back the authorization code here. As your head is the authorization. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so uh, as your head replaces Auth0, Octa replaces Auth0. Uh, your identity server also replaces also they are all like static replacements so, in each other. Yeah, why yeah, specifically, I mean, what's the, what's the reason for the popularity of bearer token as we speak? Bearer token, there are multiple other types of tokens. Why yeah. yeah. specifically yeah. bearer It's just yeah. become an industry standard. I don't know the history yeah. behind it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. The token is implies this, bearer yeah. token is the... So, yeah, you have all these uh, sample based uh, tokens as well now. I just, JWT uh, has become an industry standard. I don't know the history behind it. So, it does support the Auth0, right? If I have a customized login authentication being done, uh, so for example, there is a database in which I need to mm -hmm. do the yeah. Can this support it? No, because uh, if you are storing all the. See, here's the thing. Well, auth, so, Auth0 is not just auth authorized to authentication, it's also an identity platform. It's storing all the user profile information, right? So you, the, your app itself doesn't have to store all that information. You don't have to maintain a backend database, right? So even Firebase is a good example, right? Where Firebase itself stores all these details. You don't have to manage the uh, user uh, accounts. 
you don't have to manage uh, you know, their permission sets, everything is done through this, your app doesn't have to handle it. So if you are using uh, you know, like simple uh, password sorting and hashing and all that, when you are maintaining all that in a custom database, then all zero is not the right solution. You continue to use that. Local storage. Now there is a there are a couple of schools of thought on that. Local storage has sort of like become the industry norm, but now uh, as all the is slowly starting to push people towards uh, back end server based sessions rather than on uh, this thing. So again, uh, I'm just going to put the dogs tell me. Because we are saving all the keys in Azure key code and with the code we are connecting. So, if possible, use the authorization code grant because you don't get the tokens directly. Uh, you get the authorization code over the front channel, pass it to your back channel, and then over the secure back channel, get the tokens. What if it is Spark and uh, what if it's for Spark? Spark doesn't have a back end, everything is executing client side. Sorry, implicit flow so PKC that you earlier mentioned. Impl implicit flow and PKC don't go together. Authorization code and PKC go together. Yes, but this flow, whatever you have shown, is no longer recommended for new like they don't no longer recommend this for new apps. I don't think so. Oh, this is the article they uh forum recommendation it came in fact. I'll have to double check. Probably the Right, I think we are 10 minutes over. This is good for you actually. Yeah, right. yes. <laughs> okay, thanks Mitra. Thanks everyone. Uh, I will share out the, sorry, I will share out the slides and more samples. Uh,